So think about someone who has incredible wisdom. Think, think about somebody, maybe somebody you know, maybe it's somebody that you know about. For me, when I'm thinking about wisdom, I think about one of the great sages from the last hundred years, Michael Scott. Some of you know what I'm talking about, right? He embodies wisdom, doesn't he? I mean, really, you could subtitle The Office one step from stupid. Like, if you've, if you've seen the show, you know exactly what I'm talking about. It just showcases Michael Scott's lack of wisdom. For instance, like the time when he drove his rental car into a lake. Like, he just literally drives a car into a lake. He's got road signs right in front of him, ignores those. Instead, he listens to this really janky GPS system that definitely needed an update, which led him right into a body of water. Dwight's in the front seat the whole time, screaming at him that he's going the wrong way. And Michael just screams back, but the machine knows where it's going. Thought he was going the right way until you had to have a tow truck pull him out of a body of water. Now, it's really easy to think that something like that only happens on a show, right? And if you think that, you would be wrong. I read a story about three friends that were in Seattle for a weekend, and uh, they went out one night and, and lost, they got lost. They didn't know how to get back to their hotel. So they start re-entering the hotel address into their GPS, but while they were doing that, they, they saw something. They noticed a road that they thought was going to lead them back to their hotel. So they decided to go onto that road. They, they ignored what the GPS was saying. They got onto this road, they started driving, and almost immediately, their car started to sink in deep water. And this road that they thought would lead them the right way, this road turned out to be a boat ramp. <laughs> yeah. One of the first responders at the scene said, uh, yeah, this happens more than you think. And it's easy to laugh at that, right? As long as you're not the person driving into a body of water. It's easy to laugh at that, but this happens more than you think. And I'm not talking about driving now. I'm, I'm talking about life. Uh, you as an individual, your life is going in a particular direction. You are going a particular way. It's going somewhere. The question is, do you know what the destination is? Proverbs 14, 12 says this, there's a way that seems right to man, but in the end it leads to death. It's a very happy verse, is it not? And then Proverbs 16, 25, it repeats the exact same verse. It says it twice. There's a way that seems right to man, but in the end, its way leads to death. That's kind of concerning. That there's a way that might seem right to you or I, but in the end, it leads to a place that, man, we don't want to go. And it's really easy to look at a verse like this and just bypass it, to overlook it. You know, that's great. I, I appreciate that advice, but that's not for me. You know what? I should go get my buddy. He really needs to hear this. You should look at this guy's life, like train wreck. He needs to hear this, but I'm good. Like the, the path I'm going on in life, it's good. Yeah, sure, I've got road bumps in my life just like everybody else does, but I'm a good person. I'm going in a good way. Man, it's easy to think that. It's easy to take a verse like this and think, yeah, it's only hyperbole or it's for somebody else. So let me just say this. If you don't think this verse applies to you, you may want to take some time to do a deeper dive to look at you and make sure. Because ignoring a verse like this, that can actually be an indication that you might already be well down that way to leads to something that you don't want and a place you never would have thought imagined. Imaginable. And we probably should listen to who says this too. This is written by Solomon, King Solomon. You can hear his story in 1 Kings and 1 and 2 Chronicles. Solomon was a guy that came to, to God, and, or God came to him and said, I'm going to give you something. I'm going to give you anything that you ask for, and just name one thing, I'm going to give it to you. And Solomon says, well, I want wisdom. Like, I'm in charge of leading your people. That's an enormous task. Who's got the understanding? Who's got the, the wisdom to do that? So give me wisdom, God. God was pleased with that response that he was asking for wisdom, that's what he wanted. God was pleased with that. So God comes to Psalm and he says, okay, not only am I gonna make, give you wisdom, on top of that, you will be the wisest person that's ever lived. Nobody before you will be wiser than you and anybody who comes after you, nobody will be wiser. To this day, Solomon is the wisest man who's ever lived on our planet. He ends up writing almost all of Proverbs. He writes Ecclesiastes and Song of Solomon. Three of the five books of wisdom in the, in the Bible, Solomon writes. That's, that's pretty legit. On top of that, God comes to him and says, I'm also going to give you something that you didn't ask for. I'm going to give you wealth. So Solomon's got this incredible wisdom. 
people, world leaders would travel to Jerusalem just to have the chance to listen to Solomon. Because maybe if I could listen to him, I'll gain some of his wisdom. And then on top of that, he had crazy money, just insane wealth. So in Ecclesiastes 2, he says, anything that I wanted, I would take. Anything. I didn't deny myself any pleasure at all. Because he could. He had the authority. He's king. And this is back when Israel had superpower status. And on top of that, he's got money to no end. Money was literally no object to him. This guy had access to ways that you and I never have and never will. He had so many different ways that he could choose from. And he says, I've done everything. I've tried everything under the sun. I've done everything. I have more money than you can imagine. I have the wisdom. I've done things and gone ways that you can't even dream of. And here's what I have to say after all of that. There's a way that seems right to you, but in the end, it just leads to death. So somebody that has that kind of access, that kind of wisdom, money to do things that we could never even dream of, and he says something like that, we probably should listen, don't you think? Now, we live in a very individualistic and independent culture. We do. Like me personally, I'm naturally a very independent person. Anybody in here independent people? Yeah, Ray, don't lie. Like, Colorado's full of them, right? We're, it's okay. We're independent. It's fine. There's pros and cons to that. One of the downsides of being a very independent person is it's really easy for me to go in a way that seems right to me because I want to go in my way. Don't tell me what to do. Don't tell me to go somewhere or not go somewhere. I'm not dumb. I'm a grown man. Like, it's easy for me to do that, but just because there's a way that I want to go doesn't mean that it's right. And then on top of that, the world we live in will encourage you to go in a way that seems right to you. Because if it seems right to you, then it must, must be right. In fact, that's the only qualifier today for anything that's right. Does it seem right to you? If it seems right, you're good to go. Well, the warning that wisdom gives in Proverbs 14 is, yeah, just because something seems right to you, that's great. But just because it seems right to you doesn't mean that it's not a way that's going to end in a dumpster fire. Just because it seems right doesn't mean that it's not one step from stupid. So the question that I have is, like, why do you and I go in a way that seems right to us, but in the end it just leads to death? Why would we, like, why would we do that? Well, I, I think it starts with isolating independence. Like, you do you. Like, you're told to go whatever way you want and don't listen to anybody else. Like, what you're being encouraged to do in a very non-direct way is just Isolate yourself from everybody else. Don't listen to anyone else. Because who is somebody else to tell you which way you should or shouldn't go? Don't listen to them. You do you. But that's a trap. Proverbs 12, 15 says, the way of a fool is right in his own mind. But a wise man listens to advice. Well, that goes back to guarding your heart. This was last week. If you are isolating yourself from people who love you enough to tell you what you don't want to hear, or if you're not putting people in your life who will tell you what you don't want to hear. People that will they'll call you on stuff. People that will give you sound advice. If you're not doing that, you're not guarding your heart. Now, if you are putting those people in your life that will tell you the things you don't want to hear, people that sharpen you, people that look like Jesus, people to call you to live a life that fears the Lord. If you're putting those people in your life, if you're around that, that's a way of guarding your heart. That's a way to keep you from going down a road that leads to death and destruction or something that you don't want. That's a way to keep you from going to one step from stupid. But if you're not guarding your heart, if you're not doing it, then even a way that obviously is a disaster, that eventually this is going to be a train wreck, even a way that's that obvious, if you're not guarding your heart, even that way is going to seem right to you. Because remember last week, Jeremiah 17, 9, the human heart is the most deceitful of all things, desperately wicked. Who really knows how bad it is? And then there's, there's our sinful nature. Every single individual person has a sinful nature. Like you do, I do, everybody does. And all sin leads to death. So of course your sinful nature, so of course my sinful nature is gonna lead us in a path that leads to death. But what sin will do is sin will always try to make it seem like it's right. So even though a way may seem right, there's gotta be road signs, right? I mean, just like when Michael Scott's driving, there's road signs right in front of him, but he couldn't see them. There's got to be road signs for us too. Proverbs 12, 28 says, the path of righteousness is life. There is no death in it. The path of righteousness is right. That way is life. Okay, that's encouraging. That's good news. There is a way that leads to life, not just death. Okay, great. Well, how do I do that? Ask yourself, 
Am I on the path of righteousness? Righteousness meaning right standing with God. Like, are you on that path? How, how I live, how I treat my wife and kids, how I, I spend my time, who I choose to hang out with, how I conduct my business or how I work, the things that I think about, the way I talk to people and about people, what I do when nobody's looking, what I do when nobody's around, whatever direction your life is going right now, does that way require things like repentance? The way that you're going, does it require you to repent? If it does, that's a good sign. Or the way that you're going, does it call you to self-sacrifice? Is it not all about you? Does it call you to sacrifice? If it does, that's a good sign. The way you're going, does it have a call to holiness? That it doesn't just ignore holiness, but holiness actually means something. If it does, then that's a good sign. The way you're going, the path that you're on, does it, does it require you to be aligned with God's word? Not just the parts of God's word that you like, not just some of it, not, hey, I'm gonna do biblical gymnastics to manipulate God's word to affirm whatever I want affirmed. No, does the path that you're going, the way you're going, does it require you to be aligned with all of God's word? If so, that's a good sign. Or if the way you're going looks wrong to the world's narrative and, and the world's values, or if it calls you to imitate Jesus, if it looks like that, that's a good sign. The way that leads to life, righteousness, it's gonna have road signs like that. But the way that's gonna seem right to you, the way that seems right according to our world, the world that we live in, that road is gonna be marked by things like laziness. Not just laziness with work. I mean, we'd all agree, don't be lazy in your work. Like, don't be lazy, that's not good. But also lazy when it comes to the pursuit of holiness. Ah, oh, it's overrated, don't worry about that. Just relax. Or the way you're going, it might be marked with no change requirement when it comes to lifestyle. If it doesn't call you to change at all, you're good however you're living. Or maybe it's marked by the affirmation of any lifestyle. The only requirement is that lifestyle has to feel good to you. And if it feels good to you, two thumbs up, let's go. Or maybe the way you're going is all feelings based. Like forget wisdom, forget logic, forget reason. Feelings are your compass and they drive everything. Or maybe the way you're going is marked by subjective and possessive truth. Meaning there's a possessive pronoun in front of truth. My truth, your truth. Instead of the truth, it's my truth. Or maybe the way you're going is actually affirming all of the world's narratives and values. If the way you're going is marked by any of those things, that's a good indication that you're walking down a road that you don't wanna walk down. Like I don't care how much it seems right or especially how good it feels, that's gonna lead to consequences that you would have never wanted and ripple effects that you could never even imagine. Like which way are you really going? Now just like there are road signs when you're driving, if you can't see them, if you can't see them, they're no good to you, are they? Like they mean nothing. Well the same thing is true for us. Deception can be one of the biggest factors in why you may or may not be able to see exactly what way you're going and what it leads to and what's on that road. Deception is what makes a way seem right, but in the end it leads to death. And let's just be honest, like all of us can be deceived, like every single one of us. And if you're saying, no, nah, man, I'm too smart for that. I'm not deceived very easily at all. If that's your stance, you're probably more deceivable than anybody else in this room. Like the more arrogant and proud you are about that, the more dangerous of a position that you're in. We all can be deceived. Like, let's just be honest. We can be deceived by all kinds of things, like easiness. I mean, this one has got me more than once because easy sounds great, doesn't it? Who doesn't want easy? Who doesn't like that? Or the road, with least, the, the road of least resistance. That sounds great. Nobody's opposed to that. Now, don't, don't run into unnecessary Resistance. Don't go looking for trouble. That's just what fools do. But what can happen is that easy becomes really, really seductive. It can deceive you into thinking the best way, the right way, is the easy way. But really, easy is oftentimes just a pseudonym for avoidance. Maybe it's conflict avoidance. Which if you're just avoiding conflict all the time, not going and seeking it out, don't be that guy. 
But if you're avoiding conflicts, what that can do is it will tear down your relationships. It will weaken them at best. Or there might be somebody in front of you that you can help, that something's going on with them, but you don't want to get into it because there might be conflict. So it's just much easier to avoid conflict altogether. Or maybe easy means repentance avoidance. Repentance is hard. It is. But it's a gift at the same time. Martin Luther said the Christian life is a life of repentance. Repentance brings on new life. It brings on growth. It brings on healing. It brings on fruit. But it requires change. It does. And change is hard sometimes. It's not easy. But what easy will do is just say, you know what, let's just avoid repentance altogether. But with that, you're avoiding new life, growth, health, fruit. Now, in and of itself, there's nothing wrong with easy, but what it so often does is easy will affirm things in your life that shouldn't be affirmed because it's just a whole lot better and easy to not go there. It's easier not to change. It's easier not to correct a lifestyle. It's easier not to repent. It's easier to avoid conflict. So, you know, let's just, let's just affirm everything so I don't have to deal with any of that stuff. Now, here's what's real. The right way is rarely the easy way. And the easy way is always going to seem like the right way. That's what deception does. It also redefines normal. This is one of the most deceptive tactics that Satan's been using ever since Genesis 3. And this one is incredibly popular today. This idea to make sin look normal. Let's make sin look normal and at the same time, let's take righteousness and holiness and make those look abnormal, wrong, or even hateful. I mean, this is up in your face today. This is everywhere. This idea that we can just make sin normal and if you don't go along with it, if you don't celebrate it, if you don't participate with, with it, let alone if you try to pursue what God calls as righteousness, if you do those things, then you're gonna be made out to be the abnormal one. You're the wrong one. You're even hateful. Today, sin is even disguised and called loving. Loving sounds great. Like who isn't for loving? I mean, that's awesome. We're called to love people. But if sin is called, if loving is a disguise for sin, then that loving that actually leads to death, which is just a hard concept for us to get our heads around. But we've got to be able to see that. And then anything that has to do with truth and righteousness, which leads to life, that's called hate so that you would avoid it. This is what deception does. There's so much of an encouragement for you to go in a way that leads to death. And at the same time, you're pressured to avoid the way that leads to life. That's deception. And then there's pride and arrogance. Let me just be honest for a second. Not that I'm not always honest, but I'm going to be real for a second. That was weird. <laughs> Do you know who deceives me more than anyone else? Yeah, you got it. Me. I deceive me more than anyone else. You do the same to yourself. You deceive yourself. You lie to you more than anyone else does. I mean, why? Like, why would you ever lie to yourself? That doesn't make any sense. Why would you lie to yourself? I mean, it could be because you're trying to go the easier way. It could be because you're buying into this whole idea of redefining normal. But usually the biggest driver in somebody lying to themselves is their own pride and arrogance. Like, my pride and my arrogance are the loudest lying voices in my head. And here's what's really scary. They're often the easiest voices to listen to. Can you relate to that? Be honest with yourself. And yeah, your lying voice in your head will be the easiest one for you to listen to. For good or for worse. It's always going to be for worse. What pride will do is pride will focus you always on you. It makes everything about you. The problem with that is with pride always comes a fall and some kind of destruction. Always. It's inevitable. It's inevitable. And what pride will also do is pride will try to disguise itself as wisdom. Because we want to listen to wisdom, right? We want to grow in wisdom. Pride will try to disguise itself as wisdom so you listen to that. And you follow your pride instead of true wisdom. True wisdom will always be identifiable by humility. You will never see arrogance attached to real wisdom. Now, you can, be, you can see somebody who's incredibly intelligent, but if that's attached to arrogance, it's not wisdom. I mean, just think about this. I'll bet you that the wisest people that you know are also some of the most humble people that you know. It's true, isn't it? Now, if you're someone who's intelligent, and we've got a lot of intelligent people in here. We've got a lot of intelligent people online. If you're an intelligent person, you've got to be even more careful with this. Because intelligence plus arrogance 
That is one of the most dangerous combinations you could ever come up with. It can have the appearance of wisdom too. But whenever you take arrogance and you combine it with intelligence, all that is, is a high level disguised version of foolishness. And problems are gonna come from it. Success, intelligence, talent, experience can do the exact same thing. I mean, those are great things. We should strive for that stuff. Like, I wanna be an intelligent person. Like, I wanna be successful, I wanna be talented, I wanna have good experience. Those are great things. We should strive for those things. But I've also gotta be willing to recognize the vulnerability that can come from those things. And that might sound a little bit weird too. Like, well, Matt, what are you talking about? Intelligence, talent, success, those are advantages. How would that ever make me vulnerable? And you're right, they, they absolutely are advantages. But we also have to be willing to recognize that they're vulnerabilities because those things can make it a whole lot easier for you to go in a way that seems right to you. Because why shouldn't you? I mean, look at your resume. Look at your talent. Look at your success. Look at your intelligence. Of course you would pick the right way. You wouldn't pick a wrong way. Why would you? Look at all the things in your past and the talent that you have and the success that you're enjoying. That's just proving to you that you would never pick the wrong way. Those things can actually help you deceive yourself. Here's what's really sobering. Self-deceivers will eventually become self-destroyers. It's only a matter of time. If you deceive yourself eventually, you're gonna destroy yourself. Self-deceivers are always eventually self-destroyers. A way that seems right to you, that's self-deception. So things like success and talent and intelligence, those things have to be coupled with humility. They have to be. God, help me humble myself so you don't have to. God, help me humble myself so I can have the discernment to see which way I should go and which way I shouldn't. Humility will absolutely help you see which way am I really going right now. Pride and arrogance will block it every time, will blind you and reaffirm that you're going in the right way when actually you're heading towards disaster. Humility will help you discern, is this the right way? Discernment is key with this. Discernment is so important. It's attached to wisdom, it's a spiritual gift, and at the same time, it also can be strengthened, which is really cool to think about. Discernment is the ability to see and understand something that isn't clear. Discernment's the ability to, to judge well, and it helps you avoid one step from stupid. Hebrews 5 talks about this. This, this. I love this verse. It's really cool. Here's what it says. For those who have their powers of discernment, Marvel's missing out on that. For those who have their powers of discernment trained by constant practice to, to, to distinguish good from evil. Well, that sounds pretty cool, right? Powers of discernment. The ability to be able to see and understand something that isn't clear, the, the, the ability to judge well, the, the ability to know, hey, I should go this way, or no, I should avoid this way. That, I mean, that's awesome. And those powers of discernment, they're also attached to spiritual maturity. Like the more you grow in your faith, the more spiritually mature you are. I'm not talking about the more knowledge you know. The more spiritually mature you are, the more you can grow in discernment. And things come from that like this. This is Ephesians 4. Then we will no longer be immature like children, all right? We won't be tossed and blown around by every wind of new teaching. We will not be influenced when people try to trick us with lies so clever they sound like truth. Does that sound familiar today? Instead, we will speak the truth in love, growing every way more and more like Christ. That's just a glimpse of how valuable discernment it is. So we can grow to look more and more like Christ so we can actually speak the truth clearly in love so that we're not tossed back and forth by whatever new, whatever new narrative or whatever new value or whatever new teaching comes about so that we're not deceived by all these lies that go about today that look really clever, that sound really intelligent. The sermon helps us walk through that. It's valuable, it's powerful. But I'll bet you know someone, I bet you can think of somebody, somebody who doesn't have discernment and you can see the negative effects in their life, can't you? Just, it's one like crisis or mistake or catastrophe after another. I'm not talking about stuff that's happening to them, but stuff that they're just walking into because there's no discernment. It's powerful. But Hebrews 5 says that comes by constantly training and practicing. So how do I do that? 
Like, how do you practice discernment? How do you train discernment? Well, the practicing part, that's you acting on whatever discernment you have. Like every single person has a different measure of discernment. Whatever measure of discernment you have, if you ignore it, you're gonna dull that discernment. You're just gonna dull it. And eventually it'll fade away. Kind of like a muscle. If you never work it out, it'll just start to atrophy over time and it'll be useless, right? It'll be gone. Discernment's the same way. If you don't act on it, if you don't listen to what you have, it'll just go away and you'll have nothing. But then if you do act on discernment that you do have, however much or however little, Like this way seems right to me, but I don't think I should actually go that way. Or these people that I'm hanging with, I I, I don't think I should be hanging with them anymore. Or this thing over here, I don't think I should do that anymore. Or I I don't think I should be looking at this. Or I don't think I should say this. If you listen and act on your discernment, that's you practicing it. You'll actually strengthen it. It's just like if you're going to the gym and and you're not skipping leg day, like we don't skip leg day. That's not us as a church. Don't skip leg day. Every squat that you do, your legs get stronger so that you can do more squats with heavier weight, right? That's what happens when you practice discernment. You're strengthening it and giving yourself the ability to gain more and more and greater and deeper discernment over time. But you also have to go to the source for it and you've got to ask. Psalm 86, 11 says, teach me your way, O Lord. Let me walk in your truth and unite my heart to fear your name. And I would, I would encourage you to pray that verse over and over and over again. Teach me your way, O oh Lord. Let me walk in your truth, not mine or not the world's. Let me walk in your truth. Unite my heart to fear your name. The fear of the Lord is the beginning of wisdom, right? Pray that over and over again. Teach me your way, Lord, not my way. Teach me your way, Lord, not the world's way. Teach me your way, Lord, not my friend's way. Teach me your way, Lord. You got to ask for it. And then from that, here's God's response. This is Jeremiah 6, verse 16. God says, stop at the crossroads and look around. Pay attention. Ask for the old and godly way and walk in it. Travel its path and you will find rest for your souls. Stop and look around. Pay attention. Ask about the old way, the godly way. So who are you asking? It's people in this room. It's people in your group. This is one of the reasons, one of the many reasons why we gather in this room every single Sunday. It's not just so we can worship God, which is true. We get to do that every week. It's not so you can hear something that I might say. It's so you can rub shoulders with other people in here because there's a lot of godly people in here. Especially, we have so many people that are brand new. There are so many people. I hear this story over and over again. Some of you heard me talk about this. I've heard this story so much in the last two years. It's my first time at LifeBridge and it's my first time ever in church. Never been to church before. If that's you, I get extra excited about you. Everybody else, I love you too. But I get extra excited about you. Like, that's awesome. There's people here that have been around, that have been walking with Jesus for a while, that know that old and godly way. You being here every Sunday, you get to rub shoulders with them. And you can see it and learn it and ask about it. That's why another reason to get in a group. You're with women. You're with men that can sharpen you. And say, yeah, this is the old godly way, walk in this. And then you get rest for your souls. Because there's not a lot of rest today, is there? There's not a lot of peace outside, is there? There's a lot of turmoil. There's a lot of angst. There's a lot of fear. Who doesn't want rest for their souls? You get rest when you walk in God's way. Get around other people so you can ask. And then discernment also comes from God's word. Like, are you listening to what God's word says? Are you listening to what God is saying to you in his word? Because the more you just immerse yourself in the Bible, the, you're just jumping into the scriptures, the more you, you do that, the more you spend time with God in prayer, the more you can actually grow in discernment. But you gotta be there. You gotta be asking him, you gotta be immersing yourself in his word so that you can hear his voice, you can recognize it, so that you can hear that whisper that says, this is the way you should go. But the only way you can recognize that whisper is if you know God's voice. I mean, think about this. Think about somebody that you are really close to. Maybe it's your spouse. I hope it's your spouse. Um, If not, we've got a marriage event in October that you probably should come to. Um, It's your spouse or it's your best friend or it's a family member, somebody that you're really close to and it's gotta be somebody that you text with a lot. So whoever that person is, let's just say that I took their phone and I started texting you. It's your spouse's phone, it's your best friend's phone. I start texting you from their phone. 
Do you think you would be able to recognize that it wasn't that person, your spouse or your best friend, that it wasn't them texting you, but it was actually somebody else? Do you think you could recognize that? Yeah, you absolutely could. I bet you could pretty quickly too. Why? Because you know them. You know how they talk. You can even recognize their voice inside a text message. The same is true with God. Like the more you're going after him in his word, the more you're spending time with him in prayer, the more you will be able to not only recognize his voice, but then hear that whisper that says, this is the way you should go. Because most of the time God speaks in a whisper, not in this tone and definitely not in a shout. It's almost always a whisper. If you know his voice, you can recognize that whisper. All in all, there's only two ways. There's not a billion different ways that you can go, which makes things a little bit easier. There's only two. One is what Proverbs 14 says. There's a way that seems right to man, but in the end it leads to death. That first way, that's your way. That's my way. That's one way. The second way is what Jesus says in John 14, 7. He says, I am the way. If you've been here for the John series, we're gonna start season three at the beginning of next year. That's why we're calling it The Way. I am the way, the truth, the life. Nobody comes to the Father. Another way to read that is nobody comes to life except by me. There's two ways. There's your way and there's Jesus. So let me be straight up and ask you, be honest, which way are you going? Which way are you going? Maybe this is all brand new to you and you're like, man, I'd die. I don't know. Maybe you're actually going your own way and you can't even see it. It's a way that seems right to you. Maybe it even feels really good. But man, like, like, please just believe me on this. Just because something seems right or feels good doesn't mean it's the way you should go. Sometimes those can be the things that cover it up more than anything else. Cover up what you're actually walking towards and it's not good. It's not only death, but, a de- but it's a, an eternal death, a spiritual death. And maybe you don't have people in your life that will tell you the hard things or you don't listen to them because either pride or arrogance doesn't want you to listen to that because you are your own person. You do you. You've got it figured out. You're going the way that you know is best. But are you looking at the signs of that road? Can you even see them? It's marked by things like affirmation of whatever you want to affirm. Is it marked by you being the driver? You're in control. Is it all about you? That's going to lead you to a place, and I'm just trying to be straight up with you, that's leading you to a place that you don't want to go, and I don't want you to go there either. Or maybe you do know Jesus, and you believe in him, you've been following him, but you're, you're, you know, if you're really being honest with yourself, you're thinking right now, actually, I'm not following him. I'm doing something else. I need to turn around and go back. That's what repentance is. Man, there's grace and forgiveness all the time with that, so follow him. Or if this is you, and this is brand new to you, again, you've never been here before, you don't know what I'm talking about, this is the first time you're hearing any of this kind of stuff, man, let me just invite you right now, if you're going your own way, follow Jesus. Like, you can believe in Jesus right now. Like, you can accept him as your Lord and Savior, and, and I know even things that might feel good that you're doing right now, everybody in here that knows Christ and has been following him for, for a while knows that the way to follow Jesus feels far better than anything the world will ever offer you. It's not fleeting and it's got substance and it's got foundation. It's not broken. Because here's the thing, here's the truth. There's nothing natural about our world. Like whenever you hear that, that we live in a natural world, there's nothing, that's meant to deceive you. There's nothing natural about our world. Everything in this world is completely unnatural. You wanna know why? Because everything was broken in Genesis three when sin came in. God created the world and it was perfect, but our sin broke that, it broke away from the natural. Now we suffer and we live in the unnatural. But the great news is that one day Jesus is coming back to make all things new and restore it back to the way he originally designed it, back to perfection to make you new and all we have to do is accept him and follow him. All we have to do is that. Jesus, you are my Lord, meaning I am not the Lord of my life anymore, nor is a significant other or my career or the Broncos. Like I am, I am giving myself to you. Like I'm dying to myself. You're my Lord. You're my Savior. You died for my sin that has separated me from you. You rose from the dead. Now I'm choosing to obey and follow you and put my faith in you. That can be you right now. Man, right afterwards, go, go out of here in this hallway, bright neon sign that says new here. There's some people there that would love to answer any questions you have, pray over you. If you wanna to talk to one of our pastors, man, we can set that up and then get baptized. We're doing baptisms two weeks from today, October 1st. If that's your step, let's go. But be honest with yourself. Which way are you really going right now? 
And if you have the courage to do it, ask somebody who knows you what way you're really going. Hey guys, ask your wife which way you're going. And don't say a word in response. Just listen to her. Ladies, ask your husband which way you're going. And don't explain it away, just listen. Ask your best friend, which way are you really going? Ask somebody in your group, which way are you really going? If you don't know, and here's what you really need to do. Today, the rest of this week, ask Jesus, which way am I going? Teach me your way, O oh Lord, that I might walk in your truth, that you would unite my heart to fear your name. Fear of the Lord is the beginning of wisdom. Fear of the Lord is the beginning of walking the way that we should go, walking in God's way, following Jesus. So just be honest, which way are you going right now? Let's pray. Jesus, thank you for being clear that you are the way, that there is no other. I pray that you would give us the discernment to see that. Give us the humility to recognize that maybe we're walking away from you or we've never been following you or that we're doing our own thing and that the way we're on seems right, feels good, but actually leads to death. Give us that discernment to be able to see. Give us the humility to follow. Teach us your way, O oh Lord, that we might walk in your truth. And would you not unite our heart to fear your name? Let that be true of every individual in this room and online. Let that be true of Life Ridge. Thank you for the clarity. Give us discernment and wisdom. We love you. It's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen.